Hey guys, Kenna here. So today we're going to talk briefly about what the general sources of renewable energy are, and we'll talk about some uh, issues that come up with res respect to renewable energy, in particular about energy storage with respect to things like batteries and to the difficulty of meeting demand when we start looking at base load and peak load uh, in terms of uh, market demand for energy. Okay. Let's look at our essential questions. Number one, what are two misconceptions people have about renewable energy? Number two, what is the problem with energy storage? And number three, how are base load and peak load related to each other? Now, if we're going to be using energy sources from renewable energy sources to produce electricity, um, we can use energy from a lot of different places. We can use it from the sun, from wind, flowing water, geothermal energy, and biomass. And all of these sources of renewable energy are constantly replenished at no direct cost to us, except main maintenance of the actual equipment that does the capture and transfer. Studies show that with proper government backing in the form of research and development funds, subsidies, tax breaks, renewable energy could provide as much as 20% of the world's electricity by 2025. That number could be increased to 50% by 2050. But as of 2014, 13 countries supplied more than 30% of their electricity using renewable energy, not the US. Only 13% of US electricity was supplied using renewable energy sources. Now, We'll cover each one of these different categories individually as we finish out our year. So we'll learn more about solar and wind power and uh, hydroelectric, geothermal, biomass. But today we're really just kind of doing an overview. And we want to talk a little bit about why isn't renewable energy expanding more rapidly in the United States. And there are several reasons for that. First, people tend to think that solar and wind energy are too diffuse, too intermittent and unreliable, and too expensive to use on a large scale. But these perceptions are really quite outdated. And if we stopped subsidizing fossil fuels, the cost for these renewable resources would actually be pretty similar. Okay. The issue with diffuse and intermittent, if done correctly, and we created some sort of smart grid, probably wouldn't be too much of an issue as we could supplement it with other things uh, in the grid already. Secondly, there is a lack of government support. And this is just true. Since 1950, government funding, tax breaks, and subsidies for research and development of renewable energy have been far lower than those for fossil fuels and nuclear power. If we can re-incentivize the investment in renewable energy, the process becomes cheaper. If we remove some of those subsidies from fossil fuels and move them towards these renewable energy sources, renewable energy actually becomes cheaper than fossil fuels, which is what we're currently using. Third, while government subsidies and tax breaks for renewables have been increasing, Congress must renew them every five years which hinders investment in renewable energy because it's not guaranteed. In contrast, subsidies and tax breaks for fossil fuels and nuclear power have essentially been guaranteed for many decades, due in large part to political pressure from the fossil fuel industry. Fourth, prices for non-renewable energy resources don't include most of the harmful environmental and human health costs of producing and using them. As a result, they are shielded from free market competition with renewable energy sources. Finally, history shows it typically takes about 50 to 60 years to make a full transition from one dominant fuel to another, such as from wood to coal and coal to oil and natural gas. Renewable wind and solar energy are the world's fastest growing sources of energy. Even so, it will likely take decades for them to supply 25% or more of the world's energy or electricity. Okay. So 
what are the problems that we're running into? Well, one of the biggest problems that we currently have is the problem with energy storage. Because renewable energy tends to be more periodic, it's not as consistent because we can't burn something. The wind blows when it blows. Um, when we start looking at geothermal, we have to tap it. We start looking at hydroelectric, we have to tap it. Uh, you don't get solar energy when it's nighttime. So the rise of renewable energy has exposed a new problem and that's our lack of energy storage solutions. Today, renewable energy composed primarily of solar, wind and hydropower provides us with a more sustainable alternative as we attempt to decarbonize our society. However, despite the stable appearance of our energy supply from the consumer's point of view, a significant effort is made by network operators to guarantee that demand is met. This is a careful balancing act and achieves our needs at the moment, but there's a lot of room for improvement here. And this will likely be fueled by improvements in the energy storage sector. Now, the most promising solutions on the market currently are the pump hydro storage. This consists of using excess water to pump water up and then using the pull of gravity to regenerate energy when it's needed. So it's, it's like using the electricity when you have it to move water up to a high tank that then flows downhill and turns turbines to go ahead and produce energy when the energy is needed. And this is about 70 to 80% efficient. Um, of course, there's gonna be some loss, but it can be tapped into at any time, especially when we reach what's called peak demand hours. Then we get to the lithium ion batteries in our phones, our computers, electric cars, increasingly in our electrical grid, these batteries are currently the staple of technology today, but are limited in lifespan as they typically only last about two to three years. But CATL, which is the Chinese company who makes all the electric car batteries for Tesla and Volkswagen, says that they have a new energy pack that can last 16 years, okay? The next technology is what's known as compressed air. And it's similar in some respects to the uh, pump hydro storage that we talked about before. You're using the excess production of energy to squeeze air down into a tight little ball and then release it when you need to regenerate the energy that you use to squeeze it. And so this then is gonna compress the air. And then when you release it, it's gonna move everything back to the way it was and turn that movement into energy. Um, unfortunately, this is only efficient, efficient in the range of 40 to 60%, okay? So this one still needs some work to work out the bugs, but it is another option. And then the last one is what's known as a flow battery. A flow battery requires two large tanks with oppositely charged ion solutions that are pumped through a central system on separate sides of a membrane. And so as you do this, you end up moving cations from one side to the other, and that ion exchange uh, produces the flow of electricity. This is about 70% uh, efficient. And it looks something like this. If you're interested, you can do a little bit more research into those flow batteries. The last thing I wanted to talk about is what's known as base load and peak load. This is another challenge for renewables. Base load is the minimum level of electricity demand required over a 24 hour period. It's needed to provide power to components that always are running, um, what's known as the uh, continuous load. Peak load, on the other hand, is the time of highest demand. These are much shorter peaking demand times, but these are when we use the most energy. Okay, so again, base load is the minimum level of electricity demand required for 24 hours needed to provide power to components that are always running, what we call the continuous load, versus peak load, which is the time of high demand. And these peaking demands are often for only a short period of time. So peak demand then is the time when consumers demand for electricity is the highest and can be by day, by season, or by year. Peak periods tend to be in the morning during winter months when there's a lot of heating that's occurring and in the afternoon during summer months when there's a lot of cooling going on, the air conditioners are running. 
When looking at an entire calendar year in the Pacific Northwest, peak demand typically occurs in the winter. Although general electricity demand has leveled off over time with improvements in technology and energy efficiency, peak demand continues to have a huge impact on electricity prices. And we can talk a little bit more about this later on. But I have this quote here to finish this off today from Bill McKibben. Bill McKibben is an author, environmentalist, and activist. And in 1988, he wrote the End of Nature, which was the first book for a common audience about global warming. The one not targeted at scientists, but targeted towards the general layperson. And what Bill said was, there is an urgent need to stop subsidizing the fossil fuel industry, dramatically reduce wasted energy, and significantly shift our power supplies from oil, coal, and natural gas to wind, solar, geothermal, and other renewable energy resources. And why would we make that decision? Because the future is green. Okay, that's what I've got for you today, guys. Stay healthy, stay safe, and I'll talk to you soon. Take care. Bye-bye.